Hello, my name is Kevin Anderson. I'm Professor of Energy and Climate Change, and I previously worked for a decade as an engineer in the oil and gas industry, mostly out of Aberdeen on the Bray A and Bray B oil platforms. What I want to do over the next few minutes is outline what the maths and the science tell us about Scotland's fair and effective contribution to the Paris Agreement and how this shapes our choice of policies. Now I start by taking the Paris 1.5 and 2 degrees C temperature rise as framing our climate emergency. My focus then is on cutting emissions from our use of energy from cars to planes, homes to industry. I stick to the maths and the science and the temperature and equity commitments embedded in the Paris Agreement and I don't pander to short-term politics and economics. All the analysis underpinning this presentation is based on a peer-reviewed paper which is, linked, which is linked to in the notes. So although we start from the same science, I'll be outlining far more rapid cuts in emissions and a much more challenging policy agenda than you'll have heard about so far. So what does the science tell us about the Paris temperature commitments? Well, it's the total amount of carbon dioxide that we emit that really matters, not emission reductions far off in 2045 or 2050. It's the area under the curve we need to focus on, what we call the carbon budget. And this brings the time frame for rapidly cutting emissions toward, uh, to between now and 2030, just over the next decade. If instead we focus on 2045 and in the interim we expand our airports and we build more roads and we drive further, then we pass an impossible burden onto our children. And based on the latest science report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we know that we have a set global carbon pie, a set global budget, and that's the total amount of carbon dioxide that we can emit from now out to forever. And it's round about a little over 600 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Now that means very little to most of us, but that's about 18 years of current emissions at a global level before we've actually used up all of that budget. But before discussing what this means for Scotland, we have to recognise where we are today. Now across the 20th century, carbon dioxide emissions continued to rise. And in 1980s, the politicians at the time asked the scientists to, to produce a report on climate change. This is the first major report and it was published in 1990. But despite clear scientific evidence over the, the intervening three decades about the impacts of climate change, our emissions have just continued to rise and today are 60%, over 60% higher than they were in 1990. But what we often hear is, isn't the UK showing leadership? Now, we, we get claims like, uh, well, the emissions in the UK are down by 45% since 1990. That's something we, we, we often hear. But if you include aviation and shipping emissions, and indeed the emissions from our imports and exports, then that fall is not 45%, but actually it's only 10% over 30 years. That's less than half a percent every single year. But what about Scotland? Well, look at Scotland's consumption emissions. That's its total carbon footprint over the last 20 years. And you'll see there's been no meaningful reduction over that full 20 year period. So in 30 years, since the first IPCC report, despite a lot of hot air about UK and Scottish leadership, the reality of the numbers tells a very different story. There is no meaningful decoupling. Scotland's carbon footprint per person, okay, it's less than the people in the US, but it's over twice the global average. It's 70% higher than the average Chinese person, six times higher than the average Indian person, and 20 times higher than a Nigerian citizen. But if we've achieved so little, how is it that we have such enthusiasm about the future? Well, we've found a way to avoid making our fair cut in emissions today. And that is by assuming that in the second half of the century, after 2050, our children and our children's children will find a way to suck huge quantities of carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere and store it apparently safely underground somewhere. But these, these negative emission technologies are still mostly in the imagination of professors and a few very small pilot schemes around the world. Yet today, already our policies assume that these will work at huge planetary scale. Let's put these negative emissions to one side though and start to refocus again back on Scotland. How big is Scotland's fair carbon budget? Well, going back to the earlier global carbon pie, we can divide that between the developing, the poorer countries, and the developed countries, the richer countries. We can then ask how much of the richer countries uh, slice should Scotland actually get? We estimate uh, Scotland's fair Paris carbon budget to be between 250 and 350 million tonnes of carbon dioxide, again from 2020 out to the end of the century and beyond. Um, that's about six to nine years of Scotland's current emissions before it exceeds its Paris commitments.
If we now translate that budget and into what that means in terms of annual emission reductions, then Scotland needs to deliver 10% per year reductions in emissions immediately. That's a total reduction by 2030 of 75% compared with its current emissions and zero carbon energy by 2035 to 2040 at the very latest. That's real zero, not net zero. That's all energy from planes, homes and industry. To bring all these numbers together now and think about that in terms of the, in relation to the Scottish government's pathway, that pathway itself implies a carbon budget that is two to three times larger than Scotland's fair carbon budget. Now, if the rest of the world followed Scotland's example, global emissions would be much nearer two and a half to three degrees centigrade of warming, not the 1.5 to two that was called for in the Paris Agreement. So how from the science do we get such hugely differing results? There are two main reasons for this. First, the Scotland's Climate Act um, gets a, assumes a far larger share of the global carbon pie than is really fair. And as a consequence, other poor nations will have to accept a smaller portion. The Act also chooses to pass a large part of the need to cut our emissions onto our children and future generations, rather than make bigger and deeper cuts in our emissions today. To summarise the main points, if Scotland is to make its fair response to the climate emergency, then it needs to cut its emissions by over 10% each year from now. That would be slightly less for Scotland's poorer low emitters, but more for its wealthy high emitters who are responsible for most of Scotland's carbon dioxide emissions. The most important time frame to think about for deep cuts in emissions is between now and 2030. At Scotland's current level of emissions, it would have exceeded its fair budget in just six to nine years. And when it comes to negative emission technologies, we must research and develop these, but we must not use those to substitute for deep and challenging policies today. Ultimately, for energy emissions, we need real zero by 2035, not net zero by 2050. So what does all of this imply for effective policies for Scotland? Well, if we think about our homes, it would mean something like retrofitting 60 to 80 percent of all homes in Scotland by 2035. That's a huge major improvement in the efficiency and the, uh, the building fabric of our homes. We need to make sure that all new homes met a passive house standard. That's um, a standard whereby they would require no energy for heating. We must make sure that any new houses that are built do not include gas heating and that actually all gas heating in our existing homes is phased out by 2030 to 2035. If we then turn to transport, it would mean a rapid move away from cars in our urban environments, in our towns and our cities, and that includes EVs. We'd have to have a huge investment in public and active transport. We'd have to improve and significantly improve our charging facilities in the, in the rural environment and have coordinated public transport. We need a stringent and increasing frequent flyer levy. And all of our urban freight would need to be zero tailpipe emissions as early as 2025. And then if we focused in on the energy system, it would require massive electrification and a huge increase in renewables. And the really difficult sort of thorny issue, we'd have to phase out the oil and gas industry by 2030 to 2035, but being very careful to ensure that we had a, a just transition for the direct and indirect workers associated with that sector. This fair and effective response to the climate emergency would also have some significant benefits. It would see a major opportunity in high quality jobs in Scotland. It would see a big improvement in air quality, it would eliminate fuel poverty and improve Scotland's poor health record. It would also help Scotland to become a much fairer society as Scotland's resources, its labour and its resources were shifted towards delivering good quality public services. All this goes hand in hand with Scotland delivering on its Paris commitment, demonstrating international leadership and passing on a progressive future to our children. Let's not pretend this will not be easy, but it is much easier than having to live with three or four degrees centigrade of warming. Thank you very much for listening.